Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to church, those of you here and helping to run all the lights and cameras and to everyone watching online. We're happy you can be here with us today. Today is another lovely Sabbath here in the Okanagan Valley and we want to say hello to all of our viewers here in the Okanagan, Osuyas, Oliver, Rock Creek, Coston, Karameas, and far beyond that. Just a few announcements this morning. We want to remember our church renovations here. The Osuyas Church is undergoing some renovations to make a few things more safe and up to date. Most notably a fire exit that needs new stairs. And the bathrooms need to be upgraded to some more water conservative ways. So we ask you to remember that in your giving. Other thing is quarterlies have been delivered. If you have any questions or if you didn't receive one, you can contact Sister Andrews. And there's a phone number in your bulletin. Along with that, Pastor Zinner has Hope for Troubled Times, a new book by Mark Finley that is for sharing or for your own enjoyment and then to share with someone else. Along with that, we want to welcome Pastor Greg Wellman, who will be our speaker today. And now we will have our mission spotlight and following that, praise time. In Puerto Rico, Adventists have created a space where everyone is welcome. Centrosef is an urban center of influence that was started to help people prioritize community, education, and family. Students and faculty from Antillian Adventist University offer programs that promote healthy living. We are here in the community near our center. We are conducting a survey about what the surrounding population needs, how we can impact them, and help them in different ways. We're giving them flyers about the services we offer. We pray with the person, talk to them, see how they are, and have a good interaction with them. They have met people's needs with activities like conducting health fairs, giving clothing to those who need it, and praying with people. At the UCI, children come to be tutored in subjects like English, Spanish, and math. We also have a school for parents where we learn about emotions, what good emotional intelligence is, and how to develop and practice it with their child. At the end of the center's first semester, families and volunteers enjoyed an end-of-year holiday program. During a large celebration with food and music, the children showcased their artwork and the staff handed out special gifts to community members. But as 2020 progressed, Centrosef had to find new ways to operate. They experimented with hosting a podcast to discuss a variety of topics and promote the center's services. During the pandemic, the services needed to be adapted a little but we continued by doing online workshops for parents and art workshops for the kids. We also created a WhatsApp group where we send daily educational videos. Hola. Hello. My name is Jalis Bosquez. I'm part of the art group. I like it because I learn many things. We are really happy with the service we receive. It's been a big help to learn in the area of art, and it's been beneficial to my children, who have been quarantining and social distancing. We can't go out much, but these workshops are helping a lot, because the kids benefit, learn, and enjoy. This online shift allowed the volunteers to stay connected with people, even when they can't be together physically. They have developed an online group for women to interact and support each other. 
Me ha ayudado mucho. It helped me a lot. Many times we need support and others won't listen. And in my case, I have been living completely alone for three years. It's not easy. Centricef has done amazing things to impact this community in Puerto Rico. This quarter, a portion of your 13th Sabbath offering will help the efforts of this urban center of influence. We will continue working for the community, for the family, and for kids' education. We have other activities planned and things to do to impact everyone here. We hope to serve as a blessing for each of them in the midst of these difficult times. Thank you for supporting projects like this through the 13th Sabbath offering. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, their story is quite inspiring. You know, sometimes you have a plan and then pandemic happens and you have to shift your direction a little bit. Um, so it's nice to see how resilient and um, prospering some projects can be. Um, so their story is quite inspiring. And now that we're up here, you know it's time for our song service. And it's not a song service unless we get to sing Jesus Loves Me. So our first song today is Jesus Loves Me, number 190 in the hymn book. song today is a song I really like and it is in our chorus book and it is song number 83 and it is Seek Ye First.
refine as fire. So as we continue to seek our God, may we let him refine our hearts to build our character to do his will. Let us sing together, refine as fire. stand wherever possible, uh, wherever you are, to sing our opening song with us. This one is new to our song people, but you may know it. It's called My Savior's Love, and we'll be singing verse 1, 4, and 5.
Good morning, happy Sabbath. Um, our offering this week will be going towards Hope Channel International. And if you do not remember, you can uh, donate your offerings online at a uh, Soyuz SDA Church, or you can look up Adventist Giving. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, guide us and keep us safe throughout the rest of the week. Thank you for all that you've done for us and help us to learn something, get something out of today's message. I pray that you also be of John and Brenda and Trevor and Jim this week. I guide them and keep them safe, Lord. Also, I pray you be of Angie. She has an ankle surgery this Friday. I pray you keep her safe and a speedy recovery. Thank you for all you've done. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I'm going to read this, the scripture from 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah, and the glory that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels, to look into these things. Amen. Good morning. Glad to have you with us this morning as we study God's Word. It's wonderful to see all the young people uh, uh, ministering this morning and helping out. That is just really exciting and thrilling to see uh, young people who love God and love to serve and uh, love to keep His Sabbath and just serve Him and be faithful to Him. I have a topic called The Greatness of the Cross. The Greatness of the Cross. Now, I know last weekend was our Easter service, Easter weekend. And, uh, we, you know, we celebrated two great events, really three great events last weekend. But these are events that we can celebrate often. And that is the death of Jesus for our sins, that he died in my place. He died for me. He loves me. And he took my sins upon him. He rose again from the dead. There is victory in Christ. There is power in Christ, and when we celebrate baptism, we are celebrating the death and resurrection of Christ. But also, we also can celebrate the Sabbath in that Jesus also rested in the tomb. He rested from his finished work, just like he did in creation and then in redemption. He stayed in the grave on the Sabbath day, and then he rose again Sunday, early Sunday morning. The cosmic cross. Now, that idea, the cosmic cross, is a word that describes a big picture. I looked it up to say, okay, what does cosmic mean? And Not clicking. Okay. All right. Here we go. Yes, all right. <laughs> Here it is. Cosmic. It means intergalactic, interplanetary, interstellar, galactic, planetary, extraterrestrial, or celestial. In other words, it's really, really big. It's huge. It's beyond our little planet. Now, a couple weeks ago, I was down at Camp Hope, and I was helping Tom Klatz, our previous ministerial director. He has moved on. I believe he's gone to Montana now. 
Uh, but his last week, he wanted to do some work at Camp Hope and fixing up some cabins and fixing up their little apartment in the medical building they were working on. So I said, sure, I'll come on down and help, help you, Tom. I, I don't mind doing some physical work. But we were putting in flooring and we were putting in cabinets and we were putting in a, a, a kitchen sink and doing you know, reconstruction and remodeling. And if you're doing that, you know you're going to run into some problems, right? There's going to be problems. And so as Tom and I would be working on certain things, we'd run into a problem. Something would come up. And I have learned to have a little, little saying that I say all the time, that every problem is fixable. Can you say that with me? Every problem is fixable. And that's a good little saying to remind yourself. And when you run into a problem, every problem, with God's help, with God's power, is fixable. And God has a, a problem. It's a cosmic problem. It's a huge problem. And yet, God has a solution to the problem. Now, I just want to look at a couple verses here to lay out a foundation for our topic this morning. I love this verse in Galatians 6.14. Paul, he says, May I never boast. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This, the story of the cross of Christ was a big story for the Apostle Paul. He saw in the cross everything that met his deepest needs. And he just died to the systems and the style and the, 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 the ways of the world, the focus of the world. The love of God just kind of absorbed his attention and his focus and his mission. And he says, I just want to boast in the love of God, the cross of Christ. And he came out of a world system of me and grab and get. And he just celebrated in the cross of God. I love that verse. And here on Sabbath this morning as we worship, we can celebrate God's victory. We can rest on the Sabbath from the worldly things that pull us to get more, to work more, to strive more, to accumulate more. We can just glory in the cross and in the power of Christ, knowing that He's our Savior. I can give all things to Him and just rest in Him. Here's another verse, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. I am being saved day by day. I'm asking God to change me, help me, bless me, teach me. It is the power of God. The message of the cross is the power of God. I, the dying Savior, a story of somebody who died on the cross, seems foolishness to people. It's foolishness. You have a Savior who died he seems wimpy. He seems weak. But the message of the story is that's power. He died to self. He died to help other people. He died to be a blessing for others who accept his atonement. A couple more verses. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and what? Him crucified. You can just kind of sense that Paul loved to talk about the story of God's love on Calvary and how he, he died for us and how it changes our lives and gives us a new perspective. It takes us out of this worldly system to a kingdom of unselfishness and self-denial and self-sacrifice, caring for somebody else as God has cared for us. And one more it says, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Jesus paid a price for you. You're valuable to him. And we need to measure ourselves, not by what we think, 
Sometimes we don't feel very valuable. We don't feel worthy. But we need to look at ourselves, what God paid for us. And what did he pay? His only son, only begotten son. He gave his son for us. Now I want to just go through, oh, here's a beautiful, this is a golden statement of, of thought. I just love the far-reaching influence of the cross. Notice this, this comes from 7th commentary of the Adventist, 7a of the Bible commentary. And the writer just poignantly points out how this glory, she says that what a sacrifice is this? Who can fathom it? It will take the whole of eternity for man to understand the plan of redemption. It will open to him line upon line, here a little and there a little. You know, eternity, it'll take eternity for us to really grasp this wonderful, glorious redemption of Christ's salvation for dying on Calvary for us. The whole eternity will... We'll, all, we'll understand a little bit more and a little bit more here and there. It's a beautiful picture of grasping God's wondrous love. Now, I just want to go over our scripture reading again. Follow me. We're laying a foundation here. And I, I hope you'll catch this big picture, this cosmic picture. But Peter wrote, he says, of this salvation... This wonderful story of Christ's incarnation, his death on Calvary. The prophets have inquired and they searched. They searched carefully and they prophesied of the grace that would come to you. This was the Old Testament to the writers would write these prophetic words of a coming Messiah who would die and take our sins as a lamb who is bled as a slaughter. Isaiah 53. And then Peter says, they were searching what or what manner. You know, who, when, where, how it was going to happen. They were just trying to catch a clearer picture of this whole prophetic uh, plan. The Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow him. So they were predicting all these things that would come, and the glories that would come in, the resurrection, his ascension, his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, all these things would be coming. And then he says, to them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us. For us, our day, you, they were writing and teaching and describing that we could benefit but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The Holy Spirit had been poured out. The apostles had gone forth preaching the good news of salvation, preaching the story of Jesus. And then Peter says, things which what? Angels desire to look into. Angels are looking into this great story of salvation. I've, I've been reading my Bible through, and I came to the book of Exodus. And if you come to the last part of Exodus, you're, just, you're reading all these uh, 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 descriptions of how they built the sanctuary and they built the furniture in the sanctuary and they built the lampstand and the table of showbread and the, the, the altar of sacrifice. And then it's, it comes in chapter 37, it was describing how they built the Ark of the Covenant. And Bezalel made the Ark of Acacia wood, uh, covered it with pure gold, and he describes how the cherubim, where their wings were spread over this great Ark of the Covenant, and then it describes this. He says, the cherubim faced each other looking toward the cover. They're looking down at the cover, which is the mercy seat, a symbol of the throne of God. 
So here's a picture of the angels are observing God's kingdom. They're observing and watching how God has, is playing out the salvation story, the redemption story. He's working out the, the plan to save the human race. And so I like the way the New Living Translation says, it says, this story of redemption is, it is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. The angels are looking on. Now Paul describes this again in another verse. And he writes in Timothy, he says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. You know, being a Christian, living godly, there's this mystery of this relationship with Jesus and believing in Him and walking with Him. It's invisible. It's kind of this mystery. But he says, God was manifest in the flesh. This is the incarnation. Justified in the spirit. Seen by angels. What? Seen by angels. Preached among the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. Seen by angels. I mean, I can understand all these. Preached among the Gentiles. You know, there was thousands of people who believed in Christ. Believed on in the world. He has ascended. He's entering the heavenly sanctuary. He's ministering for us today. Seen by angels. Haven't angels always seen God and been worshiping in the presence of God? I mean, angels have been around long, longer than I have. They have seen God, haven't they? They've gathered around His throne. But the angels have not seen God in the form of the flesh. The angels never saw God take on humanity and walk among sinners and minister to sinful, broken people. They never saw Jesus being whipped by people and hung on a cross before. And William Barclay, a great English scholar, he says, seen by angels, he says, it means that Jesus brought the truth, the truth of God, even to the, ange to the angelic and demonic powers who had never known it. This phrase means that the work of Jesus is so tremendous that it includes both, what? Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. This is interesting. This is what Paul describes. He has this cosmic picture. In Colossians 1.20, he talks about, and through him, this Jesus the life and salvation of Jesus, he reconciled to himself all things, whether things on earth, now we can understand earth as broken and sinful and all messed up, earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Reconciling to himself all things on earth, Earth, now we know this earth is sinful and bad, disobedient, rebellious, cruel. It needs help. It needs God's redemption. But all things in heaven? Hmm. I didn't. Heaven needs to be reconciled to God? I mean, heaven has been torn apart from God? Now that's interesting. Does heaven need redemption? Look at these other translations. This is, comes from the Passion Translation. This is a newer uh, version of the Bible. But it says, And by the blood of His cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to Himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. Heaven needs to be brought back to original, its original intent, restored, 
By the cross? Huh, that's interesting. Here's another translation, the Message Bible. It says, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the what? The universe, the cosmos, people and things and animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross of Jesus. The entire universe needs redemption? I don't know about you, but that, I, I started to question, how does that fit? I don't get it. How is heaven broken? Well, Here's another verse, just so I don't pick it on one Bible verse, but here's another one that Paul writes about heaven and earth. I just thought this was interesting. The New Living Translation says, And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in what? Heaven and on earth. Isn't everything under the authority of Christ already? Isn't heaven okay? But something about the redemption of Christ impacts heaven and earth. And the Expositor's Bible Commentary had this comment that helped me come up with the title of the sermon. It says, the mission of Christ extends beyond the human race and assumes what? Cosmic dimensions. I don't know about you, but I thought, wow, that's a big experience. That's a big message. That's huge. A cosmic dimension. Now, Paul, he just loves this theme of God's great salvation. And he writes, he says, we speak of God's secret wisdom, God's great wisdom. Now, God is smart. You know that. God is intelligent. He can solve any problem. A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Way, way back in the far ages, God had this great wisdom. He knew that if sin popped its head up, if rebellion, disobedience would come into the universe, come into the cosmos, God had a plan in his back pocket. He knew what to do. If things got wicked and ugly and corrupt, God could solve it. Because every problem is what? Is fixable. Every problem is fixable. So God had this wisdom before time began, way, way back. God says, you know, between him and Jesus, they had this idea. They knew what was going to happen. He's going to show his love by dying for the sinner. Adam Clark, this is an old, old Bible commentary. goes back several hundred years ago, but... He he has it right. He says, even those angelic beings have got an accession, that's an addition to, their blessedness by an increase of knowledge in the things which concern Jesus Christ and the whole scheme of human salvation through His incarnation, His passion, His death, His resurrection, ascension, and glorification. Even the angels have this greater knowledge, this bigger picture of God. Now, there was a problem that came up in the universe. You perhaps know this story. You know this quote from Revelation 12, 7, about war that broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with a dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. This word war, if you look it up, polema, 
Polema, it means politics. We get the word politics. There was this battle over policy of how to run the universe. Lucifer thought his ways would be better. He said, God not fair, God not good. Billy Graham, thank you, BillyGraham.org has this comment. Look at this. This is good. Satan led a rebellion against God, hoping to overthrow God and take his place as what? Ruler of the universe, the cosmos. Satan says, I can do better than God. I can be a better king. I can take care of it better than God, ruler of the universe. The prophet Isaiah recalls this event. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will make myself like the Most High. Thank you, Billy Graham. He has it right on. Lucifer says, I can do better than God. And Revelation 12 tells us that Lucifer says his tail drew a third of the, what, stars. Remember that word, stars, of heaven, and threw them to the earth. He's told these angels, you can trust me. I will give you a better, you know, I'll give you more freedom. I'll, I'll you know, I'm a better leader. I'll let you have your way. I'm going to lead you to a higher exaltation. A third, that third can be measured almost up to half, the angels. But that's a lot of angels. And so the great dragon, Lucifer, was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who, now what's that word there? Deceives. The whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. He deceives. How do you deceive everybody? How do you deceive the world? What's a deception? It means it's false, right? It's an untruth. It's a lie. It's trickery. So how does Lucifer deceive the whole world? How did he deceive one-third of the angels? God's not good. You can't trust God. God is mean. God is not loving. His law is harsh. It's restrictive. His, his rules are, are very, it's only for his own glory. God is uncaring. He doesn't, he doesn't really care about you. He only cares about himself. All these lies, he deceives. Isn't, aren't people today, when you talk to them, and you talk about God, What's the first question? They come up, well, if God's so good, why, why does he end all the suffering? Isn't that the first question? Look at all the suffering. God must, he must not be good. He can't be caring. He can't be holy. He can't be loving. Look at all the people so suffering and starving. Is that always God's fault? Deception. Now, Jesus said a verse. Catch this. To me, this is very... Interesting. When Jesus was on earth, he said, Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. Wait a minute. Who did Lucifer murder? He didn't murder any angels. He didn't murder anybody. Not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. He's a liar. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. <laughs> That's kind of an interesting verse. But he was a murderer from the beginning. Really? Who did he want to murder? God. He wanted to take over his throne. He wanted to destroy Jesus, God. He wanted to be the leader. That's why we have in Isaiah that verse that's very poignant. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the, remember that stars of God, those angels? The stars of God are the angels. He wanted to be above the, he wanted to tell the angels what to do and how to do it and when to go and when to come. 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. This is the assembly of all the universal people, all the angels together. We'll talk about that in a minute. On the farthest sides of the north, the north is the highest place of rulership. You know, you can't, when you go north to the North Pole, you can't get any higher than that, right? That's the highest pinnacle. And in mythology, the north was a place of power where the, the, the gods would, would be king. We, we often call the king of the mountain. I'm the king of the mountain. You know, I push you over the mountain and ice take the mountain. But this is the, the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He wanted to rule the universe. But what did God do? Follow me. Follow this. To me, this is beautiful. Paul says that I, he says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God the creator of all things had kept secret. God's secret wisdom that can solve any problem. Kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church, you and me, and the, the, the power of the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. His saving, God's saving grace of changing and healing and transforming people to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the, what? Heavenly places. I want to use the Message Bible. It says, through followers of Jesus, you and me, who believe and have been saved by the grace of God and the story of the death of Jesus, followers of Jesus like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. Even among the angels. Angels are saying, did you see what God did? I can't believe it. I've been worshiping God for thousands and millions of years but then he stepped down from his throne and he came to planet Earth and he became a baby. Did you see that? God became a baby. He lived like the humans. And he let them nail him to a cross. They spit on him. Can you believe it? They nailed him to a cross. They whipped him. And the angels are saying, wow, wow. I thought I knew God was good, but I didn't know that God was that good? I didn't realize God loved the human race that much. And the angels, the angels are saying, wow, wow, wow. Again, Albert Barnes, he says, there are views of divine character which could not be obtained which could be obtained only in connection with the redemption of the world. Interesting. Okay, let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up. Follow me in closing here. This is from John Eddy. He's a, one of those old-time commentators. If you can see the date, he wrote a comment on Colossians back in 1869. And I just love this comment on John Eddy, how he, he puts this together and he says... The angels, they did not need to be saved from sin that they did not possess. They, they didn't sin. Rather, they needed to be granted the further knowledge of God that the cross reveals. <gasps> Lucifer said, God's not good, God's mean, God's not fair, God's unjust. And the angels, all this smoke kind of lingered in the universe. All these little lies kind of floated around in heaven. You know, they said, well, God's good, but he's okay. I, I like him. You know, I, he's better than you, Lucifer. But rather, they needed a, to be granted the further knowledge of God 
The cross reveals in order to have a perfected peace necessary for living eternally in His presence, they have received this in the witnessing how the Lamb that they adore has treated us. Did you see how Jesus loves those people on planet Earth? I didn't know that that's God. That's really the love of God. Wow. And the angels worship God because they see a greater picture of God. Desire of Ages says, By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Even angels didn't understand God. They thought they did. They thought they did. No wonder. In Revelation 5, in closing, this is a great verse. I'm sure you've read it. You've heard that hallelujah chorus. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. There's no Greek word for millions or billions or trillions of angels. So all it can say is there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. They encircled the throne. This is the mount of the congregation. This is the mountain of the congregation and the living creatures and the elders. And look what they say in a loud voice. Loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was what? Slain. This is the Lamb, this is the God who was willing to die for His creation, to shed His blood on Calvary, to humble Himself and give Himself for sinners. This is the God that we want to rule the universe. The unselfish God, the unselfish, self-sacrificing king of the universe to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. <laughs> wow, that's a, quite a mouthful. In Revelation 4.11, the chapter before that, they say power, honor, and glory because he created. But in chapter 5, they say, worthy is the lamb who is slain. Creation is beautiful, and we should worship God because he created. But we need to worship him because he was slain. That we could have eternal life. Eternal life. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Life with no end. Because he is love. God is love. And then John the Revelator says this. Later on in his vision, he says, Then I heard every creature, not just the angels, but every creature in heaven and earth. There it is again. Heaven and earth. Now the earth now. And under the earth. These are those who have died, who have been buried. They've been in the grave. And in the sea, now there's some debate about what that means, in the sea. Are these dead people who are in the sea? Does this mean the islands of the sea? Some people think it's the abode of the demons, the abode of the dragons, the abode of evil spirits. And someday it's true that even Lucifer and all his imps and wicked angels will bend their knee and recognize that God is good. And every being will say, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, this Lamb that was slain forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, let it be, let God rule forever and ever and ever because He is love. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. He is worthy. Are you convinced that God's ways are right? Do you know God is love? Are you tasting that love in a deeper level day by day? 
Even the Sabbath is a day of love. It's a day that God says, time out. Come out of the, ru the rush and the hurry and the busyness and just enjoy my creation. Enjoy my presence. Enjoy my love. God died to forgive us, to cleanse us, and he has an eternity for you. Have you ever thought about how long eternity is? Just think about it. Just try to grasp it every once in a while. Just try to think about eternal life. And he's given all to you. He's given it all. Have you accepted him? Do you love him? And worship him. Worship him. I want to close. Well, I'm not going to close, but our singers will close by singing this beautiful song, Holy, Holy is what the angels sing. And uh, they're going to enjoy the love of God, but we're just going to sing a little, a little bit of a different song. But I think you'll enjoy this closing hymn. Thank you, Pastor Wellman, for reminding us about God's influence and his divine power. Uh, we know that he can perform miracles, but sometimes we forget the root of where those miracles come from. Um, so as he mentioned, we will be singing a number 425, Holy, Holy, Holy is what the angels sing. So I invite you to stand with us as we sing.
Amen. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we th- thank you for your secret plan. Thank you for that wonderful plan that was hidden before time began. That you are more loving than we could possibly understand or grasp or imagine. That you rule the universe, not from power, not from your authority, but from your love. And I pray that we will again just grasp that great gift, that we live in a loving universe, with a loving God, a loving Father, a loving friend who we call Jesus. I pray you'll inspire our hearts. I pray you'll walk beside us through this week, that you'll lift us up and carry us. Father, we need your grace. We want your spirit in our hearts. And I pray you'll just bless each one. Bless these young people who have ministered here today. I pray that they will continue to serve you and walk with you and, and sense your presence. And we thank you that someday we have that hope of singing before your throne, bowing before you, casting our crowns before you, worshiping you forever and ever. You alone are worthy, Father. You alone are good. We have tasted, but we want to taste more. We want to drink the wells of salvation and feast upon a living Savior. So go with us now. Bless us as we go our separate ways, but not from your presence. So we love you. We thank you. And we give you our lives And we just uh, praise you with all our hearts, mind, and soul. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen and amen. joining us for our service this Sabbath. I hope you are blessed and you'll meet us here again next week. Happy Sabbath, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.